welcome to the Inner Circle Boardrooms. My name's Kay Chohan. This is a channel for busy professionals on the go, interested in business, finance, and leadership. My objective with this channel is to create content that informs and educates. I'll be bringing you special guests like the one we have here today, Philip Hillman, the chairman for Living Capital Markets at JLL, who are the UK largest and also globally corporate real estate servicing company. We'll be discussing everything from investing, operating models and current market affairs. If you enjoy this content, please don't forget to subscribe by clicking on the red bell icon below. So the focus of our conversation is going to be around the economical impact of student housing accommodation and looking at universities and education. Um, make no mistake, COVID has represented a massive economical hit to the higher education. Dorms being unoccupied and students pushed back against paying um, not only tuition, but also accommodation fees. As we know, Cambridge University recently announced that their lectures will be going online until at least summer 2021. So what are the impact and implications of that on students returning back to universities? And we've also seen that um, many colleges and universities have seen a drop in revenues from foreign students, which will be a massive blow to a lot of P&Ls there. So just to break this down into context, we know that on average, there's about 2.5 million students in the UK at any one time. Approximately about 1.9 million of those are UK residents and about 400 thousand are international students and just to give you some numbers China is the largest consumer of UK education by about 120,000 students then you've got India which is about you know give or take 27,000 then you've got United States which is about 20,000 Hong Kong Malaysia Italy France Germany Nigeria and Greece I'll include all that information below. But I was really interested to bring our guest on today um, because of his foresight and insight into um, what's going on economically. So, Philip, thank you very much for joining us here today. I really appreciate you coming online with us. For the sake of our audience, can you just give a bit of backdrop in terms of who you are and a bit about yourself? Yes, thank you, Kay. But Philip Hillman, uh, as you just mentioned, I have a role at JLL, um, which is of as being chairman of the Living Capital Markets team. So that's focusing on transactions, capital markets transactions. And I have been involved in the student housing sector, predominantly in the UK, but also across Europe, where we've seen an emerging market, and also in India and in Australia and in Africa. I've been involved in the sector since the early 90s. Uh, and in the early 90s, it was really... Uh, it wasn't even nascent in the UK. It was a completely new sector, really. You had university halls of residence and you had shared houses or houses of multiple occupation, HMOs. But you didn't really have much in the way of purpose-built student accommodation. And that purpose-built student accommodation, or PBSA, as you might hear it called sometimes, um, has grown to become a very significant part of the way that uh, students are housed in the UK. And, and furthermore, it has also become a global asset class in its own right. When I started, as I say, back in the 90s, uh, my fellow colleagues and partners of the business I was involved with then thought, well, what, you know, what's Philip playing out? Uh, you know, this student housing, well, what's that? Is that residential, commercial or what? Uh, whereas now nobody questions the scale of the sector and we have seen some mighty big transactions uh, of student housing portfolios across the world and particularly here in the UK where you know in a typical year we might see anything from three and a half billion to five six billion pounds of student housing portfolios traded uh, with uh, the purchasers being investors from all around the world. So I continue to be involved in that sector. Uh, my first 10-15 years or so uh, my first 10, 15 years or so in the sector were predominantly doing valuation work um, at a time when there was very little evidence. So that was quite a challenge. And then over time, I moved to get involved more on the uh, transactional side as we began to see uh, investment transactions taking place. And then 
but from around about 2010 until the present day, um, we have been involved in extensive transactions and I have found myself working much more now in those emerging markets, particularly across mainland Europe. So that's rather a long introduction, but uh, there you are. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So tell us right now, Philip, what sort of conversations are you having right now with um, those asset class owners, um, uh, landlords and tenants? Sure. So uh, it's obviously obviously been a very interesting year um, because, uh, as you rightly mentioned, there's been significant disruption due to COVID. But if I can perhaps just put the present in context by just talking about what was happening before COVID kicked off. Uh, if you go back to January or February of this year, we had a situation where occupancy levels of student accommodation were the highest they've ever been. And when we talk student accommodation and occupancy levels, typically we're talking 97, 98% occupancy in term time, in, in the main letting period, which might be 44 weeks perhaps, and then the, the separate arrangements for the summer holidays. So we had very high occupancy levels right across the sector. We also had good rental growth, uh, RPI inflation beating uh, rental growth, which has been consistent over the last 15, 20 years or so. And we also had very strong investor demand and very strong global investor demand. So we've had a lot of interest from sovereign wealth funds, from uh, global pension funds, uh, and actually, interestingly, some of the first people to be involved in the sector were the private equity funds, and they're still uh, very involved. The difference from now and 10, 15 years ago is that the pension funds are much more comfortable with the sector because they understand it better uh, because they've seen transactions of scale across the globe, and particularly in the US, the UK, uh, and Australia, and increasingly in mainland Europe. So go back to January or February, um, there was a feeling of, great, there's been an election. No matter what your politics are, the, the, the key feeling was, thank goodness, we've got over that Brexit chaos, at least for now. We also had um, significant disruption following the tragic Grenfell fire, because a lot of student housing developments uh, had uh, cladding, which there were question marks on. Uh, and even just getting testing for your cladding was very challenging. It's taking a long time for people to get proper testing done on their cladding. So a lot of transactions that might have happened didn't happen. And then Brexit definitely slowed down the market. And a lot of people were sitting on their hands. Uh, a lot of people who might have been taking a portfolio to market or might have been purchasing. But notwithstanding that, um, if you go back to January, February, we had seen um, a pretty decent level of transactions the previous year, 2019. We, you know, we've seen about three and a half billion pounds of transactions, possibly four billion. And then as we got into the early part of this year, things were looking really very solid. And as we just as we got to the point of the national lockdown, so in mid-March, uh, we actually had one of the biggest transactions the sector has ever seen. We had a £4.7 billion acquisition by US private equity house Blackstone of the IQ student housing portfolio, which was a substantial portfolio of purpose-built student accommodation across the UK. And that was at record levels, record pricing, and clearly it was one of the largest transactions as well. So that closed about two days before the national lockdown started yeah. and as soon as the national lockdown started everybody began to think what in the, what on earth is going to happen with students and the universities are the universities going to shut or what's going to happen so we very quickly got into a position where students and universities were in a fairly heated dialogue about uh, you know where they're going to receive refunds if they had booked accommodation because the universities were effectively shut across the UK and Europe most universities were shutting and students were not on campus. Um, universities were a bit slow in deciding what they were going to do. One of the biggest private operators in the UK, a company called Unite Group, uh, were the first to make a major statement that they would offer a, a refund to students who had paid in advance for accommodation and that they would let those who had paid and who are coming into accommodation but no longer needed it, they could go home and not have to pay for it. Most of the other operators followed suit, although 
that each offered their own version of the refund package. Uh, and I think actually it was to some extent a coming of age of the sector. Uh, the sector was behaving responsibly. Um, it knew that there was a, a crisis for students and it felt that it wanted to uh, keep a good long-term relationship both with the universities and with students. And I think it shows that the, you know, the student housing sector, certainly the purpose-built student housing sector is really now part of a bigger hospitality sector rather than just being bricks and mortar you know here's, here's your room and we'll see you in the years of time the the operation and the management of those halls of residence is very much a key part uh, of of what creates the value of these portfolios uh, and i can tell you from my experience they are extremely well managed uh, you know the, the, the people sometimes often say oh students you don't want to be near a student hall of residence be awful well actually uh, the students are really hard working and I know there's a lot in the press at the moment about abuses if you like of, of the current local lockdowns but uh, the students are much more responsible than when I was a student let me put it that way back in the back in the 80s so um, I think what is quite extraordinary is how the operators responded uh, and the operators have been pretty flexible uh, about the current levels of um, the current levels of, of demand and occupancy and students requests to have um, refunds. What we have seen now is that the universities have largely opened again, students have gone back, but we are of course conscious that it is something of a hybrid experience at the moment, a hybrid in the sense that there's online teaching uh, and some face-to-face -face teaching and in some universities that face-to-face -face teaching is minimal uh, and so there are discussions and of course it's in the press daily at the moment about where the students are being properly looked after, are they being managed, should they be sent home, uh, are they a threat in terms of the Covid spreading etc. But uh, what we have seen this year is an ongoing confidence from investors. Uh, we've got a number of student housing portfolios that we will be taking to market shortly uh, and there is really strong investor interest. The view is that student housing is not like the rest of the hospitality sector. If you look at hotel sector, you know, they are having an existential crisis. We don't have that in student housing as a sector at the moment. Uh, we've got organisations, operators who are backed by um, investors with very deep pockets. These are pension funds, these are sovereign wealth funds, uh, global institutions. Uh, they are taking a long-term view. They've recognized that there's gonna be a, a loss of some income in the uh, interim. And I think, you know, for the next six months, there'll probably be further losses of income, um, possibly even through to 12 months. The hope at the moment is that come next September, that's September, 2021, there will be a degree of normality but of course as you and I know you know who knows it depends obviously on what happens with the vaccine. You've mentioned so much there and I want to deep dive into loads of that Philip so I want to break yeah. some of that down into components and get a conversation going with you. Start off with occupancy rates um, just to understand those what did you see pre and post obviously pre you were saying it was very high um, yeah, so pandemic and coming out of the lockdown what are you seeing? Yeah, so pre-covid most student housing developments, there's always been the odd exception, but the vast majority of operational student housing was operating at about 97% occupancy in the main letting period. And that main letting period would typically be September, October till uh, the summer. Uh, and then the following summer, um, either the students can opt to stay in over the summer or those rooms are let to others, uh, normally students, um, who've decided they want to, to stay in for, for a longer period. So occupancy pretty much across the sector and, and you know when most people are doing valuations of student housing they're trying to adopt typical occupancy levels and 97% is pretty much the norm as to what the term time the you know the average letting period occupancy level was and then over the summer you'd adopt a much lower occupancy because um, the summer in most cities you know, you might get some cities, uh, some students in. If you're in Edinburgh with a festival normally, or if you're in London with lots of tourists and so on, then actually, you know, language schools, you might see a higher occupancy in, in the summer. So we've gone from 97% occupancy to right now, as students are still arriving, but most have now arrived, uh, the majority of, of developments are around about 80% occupancy, uh, which is clearly a lot less than normal. 
Uh, on the plus side, it does give the operators some potential to do some quarantining as and when required in terms of moving students that are infected into um, you know, some of those empty rooms. Uh, and I think most investors have taken the view that um, you know, they will continue to have that lower level of occupancy for the next 12 months or so. People who are buying student accommodation at the moment are nearly always asking for um, uh, an underwrite of occupancy levels to um, effectively guarantee a normal level of occupancy. So it would be quite normal if you're buying a student housing investment to demand a 97% occupancy guarantee for the next 12 months. And the investor will, and the seller will normally be quite happy to do that. They don't want the, the current 80% occupancy to be assumed to be the long term. The purchaser will take a view that this is probably a temporary, you know, a temporary thing, and at least it helps them to top up their income level so that they're able to get an appropriate return for the investors even during that first disturbed year. So, so, uh, so they're not paying asking price then, um, they are asking for some sort of discount is effectively... Well, no, interestingly, I think, you know, that we, we, had, we had expected to see some significant discounting because of all the bad press like the sector has been getting. Uh, actually, the discounting has not been on the level that we would have expected. And I don't want to sound like a, the cheerleader for student housing. I mean, I'll tell you the bad stuff as well. But the the occupant the pricing uh, issue at the moment the cost of that occupancy guarantee has to be put in place and there is a an associated cost with that in terms of the multiplier on income or the, you know the yield as we would say in property terms um, we are not seeing any significant change probably what we are seeing is that that transaction I mentioned to you back in March the the 4.7 billion pound one that was done at record levels. And we're not seeing transactions at that level. We're seeing transactions probably at where we were last September, when they were pretty healthy, uh, strong, strong transaction levels. Uh, but the, that absolute sort of peak of the market pre-COVID um, isn't being replicated at the moment. And it may be some time before we get back to that. What, what was last year transacting at roughly, just to get an idea on comparisons? volume levels or yeah in terms of you were talking about that transaction of four point yeah so I, I mentioned that uh, last year was about there was about three and a half uh to four billion uh pounds of, of student housing transactions mostly in big portfolios and the par for the last seven or eight years has been around about three and a half billion uh, okay. this year is distorted because of that 4.7 billion transaction early in the year uh, and probably this year we will get to five billion Oh, really? So it, would, it would have been a, a poor year had it not been for an extraordinary large transaction back in, back in March. So, you know, it's, uh, it's not on its feet. Uh, the people are seeing student housing, <coughs> excuse me, as an alternative investment sector, the sort of investment sector that actually is a safe haven. And you might say, well, it doesn't sound very safe, Philip, because there's all these issues with COVID and so on. Well, yeah, there is that. But most people are taking the view that isn't forever. That people, when it's time to go to university, they don't tend to put it off for two or three years. They tend to go when you're 18 or whenever. Um, many families will make a lot of sacrifices before they say we can't send little Johnny to university. Uh, the big issue I think for the moment is the domestic students have largely returned. The international students is another matter. Uh, we've seen very strong levels, as you said in your introduction, of students from China and India. And actually, those levels are still very strong this year. But the problem for the operators at the moment is that there's a lot of student, international students who've paid their deposits, but haven't actually turned up. And they are not sure if their students are really going to turn up. Uh, and there has been, both in the higher education sector and in the private PBSA sector, I think an over-reliance on international students. Now, international students are, are very attractive for universities. They pay two or three times the fees of a UK student. And for the private sector operators, uh, international students tend to pay the premium rents as well. They tend to go for the better accommodation. So if you went to London and looked at most of the premium student housing developments, about 70 or 80 percent of the beds would be occupied normally by international students. Uh, the British students, bless them, have rather been priced out. 
Uh, what really happens is that the international students book online from overseas uh, because it's by far the most convenient way to do it. What you don't want to be is an international student turning up in London, a city you don't know, uh, suddenly trying to find a rented flat uh, and having to take a, an Uber or, or whatever all around the city to find a rented flat. It's just not practical. Plus you want to have a safe environment uh, and you want the reassurance of it being a managed safe environment. And you probably want to meet some other students from your nationality and indeed other nationalities as well. And so that's why the, the, the purpose built student housing sector has actually created a, quite a significant community within these buildings. They are communities. Uh, and that's been very attractive to a lot of international students. So we're waiting to see what's going to happen with international students. My view, and that I think of many of my colleagues and investors around the world, and indeed the universities, is that this year is going to be extremely disrupted as regards international students. Either they can't travel, or they're reluctant to travel, or they're reluctant to spend the money on what might not be a normal student experience. And if you are going to study abroad, it's going to cost you a lot of money. And so you want to be confident that you're getting value for money. So the operators and indeed the universities of this year really decided to focus on domestic students. Uh, and it's probably somewhat overdue because, uh, you know, the sector, it's not right to have so much focus just on the international students and to neglect the poor old British students. Sorry, I digress, as ever. No, that is fantastic. You're answering all my questions. So this is- Oh, brilliant. sorry, I can make some more up if you like. <laughs> Excellent, thank you so much. What I want to understand, there's still so many components I could break that down into and, yeah, and we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll try and get through these as, as we can. What are the main cash flow issues? You've already mentioned a 4.7 billion transaction. You know, when you're making those sort of transactions, you are looking at a long term investment. However, we are in a time where, you know, no one counted for a pandemic yeah. of this scale. So um, that has a level of impact because it shifts the way um, people, you know, people's behaviors, but I do appreciate people go back to old ways of work. What are the main cash flow issues from faced by investors? And, you know, how does that start impacting things like the way that these businesses are set up from a financial perspective? Okay, when we're looking at the income received from a student housing development, uh, normally when we're appraising the value of that development, we'll do a discounted cash flow appraisal and we'll have effectively the elements that produce the income, and then we'll have the elements that uh, are the expenditure side, and you've got your net income that you can then capitalize and create a capital value. The elements of the income normally are quite simple and straightforward. It is so many rooms at such and such a rental, and you might have different rental points for different rooms. Yep. You might have different rental points for, um, different lettings. So if you take a year's rental, you might get it slightly cheaper than if you do it term by term. Traditionally, term by term in advance was the normal payment method. And extraordinarily low level of defaults in the student housing sector, uh, typically around about 1% of that. Um, often there is a parental guarantee, uh, but even that isn't very often uh, required. If someone does leave, supposing someone gets kicked off their course or something, um, it's often still possible to find someone else to take over the room. So we've seen what has been a very secure income stream and secure also in the sense that there are in any buildings of, of, you know, several hundred tenants effectively, all coming from different backgrounds. So your risk is, is quite spread. And with international students, again, uh, your risk would be very spread across lots of geographies globally. And so a recession in one country, would, you know, if the Indian students go, well, the Chinese students would probably turn up. Mm. Um, so in terms of the income stream at the moment coming in, um, what we're seeing is a disruption. We've seen a reduced occupancy level, perhaps 97% to 80%, or in some cases, 50 or 60%. Uh, and the very worst might only be at 50%. Uh, I don't think there's too many at that level, but there are some developments that I'm aware of that, that are trading at those levels just at the moment. There'll be an opportunity for them to possibly fill up in January because there are students who arrive in January for other courses. Not all courses kick off in September. And there are the opportunities, for example, to take uh, quite a few lot of American students will come over on shorter courses 
uh, and they'll come over typically in January or February. So there are opportunities still to, to fill up those, those rooms. Uh, the expenditure side is largely going to be, you know, the, the operation of, of the residences. And we typically in the UK see the running costs of student residences ranging from anything around about £1,800 per bed per annum to about £2,600 per bed per annum. Um, so we've got, uh, which might be some typically somewhere in the order of 20, 25%. Uh, by the way, of the gross income. We've seen in the last six months or so probably an increase in those running costs because of the extra sanitation, uh, you know, the COVID safe requirements, etc. Although I was told by an operator only last week that in fact, you know, the, the, the marginal cost of that is, isn't so great. Uh, you know, the, what, what really matters is bums and beds. It's getting the occupancy level as high as possible. And I think most operators are, you know, been working really hard this last few months, last couple of months particularly, <coughs> to market afresh to domestic students and to try and get that occupancy level uh, up. And they'll be doing giving away incentives sometimes, some discounts, what have you, perhaps, to get those uh, beds filled. And when they haven't, they will, they will be hoping that during the year there's still a chance to catch up. But I think in reality, most investors have already taken the view that if they're in the student housing sector, they're in it for the long term, and that you can't expect to go through a global pandemic and, and not have some income loss. So there will be some loss of income this year. Everybody knows that. Um, and because actually, you know, in a strange, perverse way, because everybody's losing some income, it sort of doesn't feel so bad. When you really feel the pressure is when your hall isn't doing so well and everybody else is thriving. So there's the, the pressure's off slightly. Do you, do you think we'll see some distressed operators coming yeah. uh, through 2021? What do you anticipate to see? Just bear in mind again, I'm talking here about the purpose-built sector. I'm not talking about HMOs, houses of multiple occupation. HMOs are largely run by private landlords. And they, if I can call them amateur landlords in many cases, that's not meant to be, you know, disrespectful, but they are often, you know, they'll, they'll, someone will buy a house, fill it with students and do what they have to, to keep it tidy and, and what have you, and, and just take the rent. Thank you very much. That's a very different business to the purpose-built sector. In the purpose-built sector, uh, we haven't seen any significant distress yet. One of the reasons for that is that a lot of the, you know, a lot of them are backed by, pension funds, etc. So there's deep pockets there. Secondly, the levels of gearing in terms of bank debt are a fraction of what they were in the global financial crisis of 2008-2009. Uh, uh, in 2008-2009 we saw significant distress. Some big operators, the names like Opal, went under when RBS effectively pulled the rug. Um, and that was in part because of exceptionally high gearing levels. And also RBS didn't behave very well, that's, that's another story. So what uh, we've got today is a situation where many portfolios will be leveraged at 45, 55%, perhaps something like that. Whereas back in 2008, 2009, many of them were leveraged at 65, 75, 80% or sometimes more. So that has greatly reduced the, the pressure in terms of potential action by the banks. The banks themselves at the moment, I must just talk about lending for a second. Um, the banks have had an initial knee-jerk reaction to all the publicity. You mentioned that uh, example of Cambridge University that's, uh, who was picked up by the BBC, I think, initially, that they uh, did a statement saying we're only going to do online teaching. Um, the, there was a very strong feeling at the university that the BBC had greatly misled people. That statement was only taken in part. The, what came in the press wasn't what was said by the university. The university said, yes, we're going to do online teaching. But they also had said, we're going to encourage students to come back and we will offer a hybrid of online and face-to-face -face tutorials, etc. Uh, that actually having, you know, one of the great things about the Cambridge experience, and I'm sure Oxford would say the same, is uh, small group teaching. Uh, and also, you know, you're in, you're in um, relatively small 
residential halls, uh, colleges you know, with a college format. And so the whole experience of being at Oxford or Cambridge, they would say, is, is, is something quite special. Uh, and you will be getting um, teaching uh, in all sorts of ways and the university experience will still be there. It might not be as quite normal, but there will be still be something there. So what we saw with that Cambridge thing was the BBC saying, oh yes, it's all gonna be online. And so everybody took the view that the students were not going to return to campus and that all universities were gonna sort of give up on trying to get universities to campus. Well, we've seen that universities have encouraged students to come and now you're getting the backlash from a lot of students who are saying, hey, this isn't what I expected, it's all going online because we weren't expecting a big second wave just yet so there's clearly a lot to happen and there will be a press story every day about what's going on in the universities whether it's quite questioning the level of teaching by the universities you know it's, is virtual teaching what you really wanted why did you get us here for that um, questioning value for money questioning behavior of students who might be having a riotous party somewhere and getting into big trouble um, there's always going to be a story on that so the banks didn't like stories like that coming out initially and they tended to lump student housing alongside hospitality the hotel sector particularly um, in terms of saying right no new business we're not going to do any new lending on student housing and things did pretty much dry up for the first few months March April May June they did carry on with their existing clients and there were people who had deals and transactions underway uh, developments underway they carried on supporting those and they did some new business uh, and we've got a debt team uh, in our JLL business who are extremely busy um, doing some new business, but also obviously servicing those uh, existing uh, debt arrangements. What we've seen of late has been a, a more relaxed, more relaxed view by the banks. They have been, on the whole, uh, taking a, a more considered view. Uh, there is still uh, a difficulty in getting debt. I mean, it's not dried up like in the way it did in 2008, 2009. This isn't a credit crisis, but I think the availability of bank debt for new transactions and new developments is gonna have an impact over the next 12 months. Uh, I think we're probably gonna see uh, a change from levels of gearing being at a maximum previously of 65%, perhaps going down to 55% of value or cost. Uh, so that if there's less gearing, that probably will equate into prices being affected. But at the same time, that's while that's a negative factor, the demand side of things is still very strong. We've got a lot of international investors, particularly Far East, Singaporean, um, who are very, very keen on getting into the student housing sector. We've got a lot of parties who are trying to try to set up new funds uh, and encouraging people to invest in their student housing funds. Um, as I was was saying before there is this view from investors that student housing is a relatively safe haven uh, more people go to university in a recession it's been proven over many many recessions so to a certain extent student housing can be seen as contra cyclical more people go there when it gets really tough because if you can't get a job you might as well go to university and you might as well increase your your levels of qualification to increase your chances of getting a job and even when we had the last financial crisis and we had the introduction of tuition fees uh, going up from 3,000 to 9,000 a year, we didn't see any significant drop off in student numbers. So the, the domestic demand has been incredibly resilient. And notwithstanding COVID, which we'll come back to in a minute, international student numbers have been growing very, very strongly globally and were predicted to grow, you know, very strongly for the next 20 years or so. In terms of domestic numbers in the UK, uh, if we look at the number of 18 year olds, we've been having a falling demographic of 18 year olds uh, for the last 15, 20 years. When we get to 2021, uh, we are on the beginning of a quite steep curve of increasing number of 18 year olds. Uh, and there is predicted to be uh, probably demand for some two to 300,000 additional university places as a result of the increase in the number of 18 year olds between now and 2030. So all things being equal, 
we need several hundred thousand new university places. Now, most universities are 15, 20, 25,000. You know, that would be a really big university. A university city, which might have two universities, might have 30,000 students. So actually, we're looking in this country at the need for quite a few new universities on top of what we've got. Uh, yes, people are questioning the value of higher education, quite rightly so, because I think you know governments have had targets of getting 50%, 40%, 50%, or we've reached 50%. And many would say, and I would say, should we be sending everybody to university? What about the more vocational courses? What about the, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, trying to get people into industry and, and science and so on through other, or, you know, other, other more vocational courses at uh, be that at colleges or be that through uh, training, which is part uh, part of employment and part time education. So I'm not a big fan of saying there should be a huge increase in participation. But we are seeing a more diverse group going as well. We've got people from different backgrounds going now. That is increasing. It's not right yet. It's not balanced, but there is that's increasing as well. So um, one of the reasons that you know I feel student housing is actually is going to be a good long-term investment is the domestic uh, demand looks set to be pretty strong, partly because of the demographics, partly because of increasing wish to go to university, and and also. Uh, because I think at the end of the day, one thing we've learned from this pandemic, pandemic is that kids don't want to stay at home. They don't want to study online. A lot of people said, oh, what about, you know, MOOCs, massive open online courses. Isn't that going to be a threat to the sector? Online teaching will all be done like this. <laughs> um, and no matter how uh, much you try and engage with a camera in front of you on an iPad or whatever, you, at the end of the day, it isn't the same as having someone in the room looking you, look you in the eye. So I think actually if ever there was a time when online teaching was going to take off this was it and it's been a great help but it isn't what students really want given the chance they want to go away to have a higher education experience living away uh, living away from home and actually what should be a relatively safe environment to do that if i can patronizingly say as a father that bit of growing up that still needs to be done by moving out of your family home for a while. I'm going to challenge you a little bit, if Go I may, on. just because I want to be controversial. I'd like your thoughts around affordability, especially when oh, you yeah, take into consideration it. the average student accumulates yeah. approximately about £21,000 in student debt. Um, yep. With unemployment and um, stagnation in productivity, and to provide some context around that, we know that nearly uh, half a million uh, young students aged between 16 and 20, um, 24 years old are unemployed from May to July uh, 2020, and we're seeing an inc and that's an increase of about 36,000 from um, previous quarter, um, and an increase of 76,000 from the year before. Four. This is the highest level of unemployment that we've had for students since 2016. With that said, when you take the impact of the pandemic, like students work in restaurants, yeah. bars, um, uh, to be able to pay for the cost of living and to then take into consideration deprived areas and backgrounds and you were talking about focusing on the domestic market more mm -hmm. how do you forecast students will pay for this or do you take into consideration the accumulation of debt and then they leave university to then get employment and get onto the property ladder and um, do you think it's a case of just deferring payments well i'm going to start by being slightly controversial myself and say i absolutely loathe the idea of student debt uh, and uh, when I was fortunate enough uh, to be at university, I got grants, I even got housing benefit, uh, and I was, you know, I, I, I didn't need it, but I got it. Um, so I, came, I was one of those lucky folks who didn't have to incur any you know, baggage, if you like, of student debt. I don't want to sound like a government spokesman here, because I'm certainly not, but you shouldn't just look at student the debts that students have in the sense of debt like credit card debt or a bank loan. It isn't that. It's really a tax. The way that the, the student loan company uh, debts are operated is that you only start paying them back when you reach a certain level of income. Um, is that threshold 21,000 or something like that, I think, at the moment? Um, and as you, you have a very long period to pay them back, 
so really, you know, they, they should, it should be seen as if you, it's almost a graduate tax. And I think it's quite likely that the whole system will be shaken up and there will probably be a graduate tax in due course. So I don't think, I think it's unhelpful to talk of it as though it's like the sort of debts that you incur when you've just gone a bit crazy with the credit card and you've bought the stereo and you've bought whatever, fashion clothes and so on. This is very different. This is your education. This is an investment in your future. If I was a working class kid, it would scare the life out of me. And I think it's one of the biggest issues for the sector at the moment is how are we going to encourage people to get involved if they hear all this talk of debt and the numbers are eye-wateringly large. <coughs> if you want to rent a room in London, you know, you're going to be paying £150 a week minimum, possibly a lot more. Um, that's, you know, probably three or four times what you'd be paying in mainland Europe. If you want to go to study a university in mainland Europe, most countries it's almost free and some places like holland they actually pay you to go to university so we've got a very expensive system um, notwithstanding that we still have very very high participation and we also happen to have at the moment some of the world's best ranked universities uh, in fact you know if you look at uh, the uk after the us we have the most high-ranking global uh, universities in terms of ranking so there are good reasons why people are attracted to our universities, both domestically and internationally. But yeah, you know, I worry a lot about this debt issue. Uh, and I also worry about people going to university, perhaps being encouraged to do so when maybe they, you know, maybe it's not right for them. Um, and I'm worried about, for example, after that A-level fiasco, uh, that there will be a lot of people who actually have had their grades uh, higher perhaps than they might have got and who will potentially drop out and there is a, a shockingly high level of dropouts at quite a lot of universities and I think that's a scandal. Uh, they will have debts associated with that uh, and they will have you know the emotional scars if you like of having started somewhere and not having a chance to finish it. For many people that's going to be uh, something that really lives with them. Others Oh, that's fine, it's, it was an experience and I've moved on. Uh, my youngest son went to university, did two years and then uh, then left. Actually, I think he looks back on it, it as still, you know, it was a useful, useful time and he's gone on there and doing really well doing something else. But yes, it is, it is an issue. Um, is it going to lead to falling demand? I think affordability for me isn't just about going to university, it's all about the price of your accommodation and a lot of the private sector purpose-built student accommodation is, as I said, aimed at international students. It's very expensive. There are more affordable offerings, uh, but they are not that common. And so I think the big issue is how are we going to provide affordable student housing? And a lot of the operators have been changing their profile of what they offer from the studio self-contained flat, which is the most expensive, typically taken by a foreign student or, an inter or a postgrad, uh, towards the more sort of cluster flat arrangement, perhaps of six or seven beds, sharing a kitchen diner. Uh, and those beds being probably en suite. Uh, so there are ways you can try and make that accommodation cheaper, but the main way you do that is by choosing a site which is where the land's cheaper, because the land is the biggest cost by far. Yeah, and, and most, that, stu most students want to be near towns. They're not fussed, actually, about being next to the university in most cases. Uh, most students would probably rather be in town centres. And yeah. the universities aren't necessarily in town centres. When the parents come on the open day with them, which they often do nowadays, um, the parents probably think they'd like to be by the university. But actually, I don't really want my students actually really want. Uh, so I think this issue of choosing the right sites and actually... Over the years, student housing has tended to be built on the sites that are not absolutely prime residential sites because they'd be outbid by residential developers. Yeah. So re prime resi will normally outbid student. Uh, so if it's prime resi, it's not going to be a student site. So you go to the place that's just a bit cheaper. So if I can take London as an example, um, the big developers like Unite were really changing focus from zone one, zone two, on the tube central london area to moving more towards the sites such as king's cross sorry not king's cross moving more towards the sites such as uh, stratford and wembley and back in 2005 when i was involved working on development site at king's cross king's cross was 
a pretty rundown area. Now, of course, it's thriving. It's got Google and all sorts there. Uh, really, really prime location. So often the student housing actually is part of a, a gentrification of an area. The students come first and, and then the area um, you know, the, becomes more expensive as services come to service those students and others. Yeah. You spoke about students, uh, international students wanted almost like a self-contained apartment um, and domestic students being willing to share a dorm. Um, do you think because of the pandemic that will change behaviours? Yeah, like so I'd love, I'm glad you asked because uh, it's what we've all been chewing on chewing over the last few weeks. Um, early on, my view was that this year, more than ever, a studio would be attractive. Even though it's more expensive, um, it clearly does create your own little bubble. So you've got your own little kitchenette in your studio, you're self-contained. What I can tell you though, is that for the last um, 15, 20 years, there's been a battle going on between developers and universities. The universities have said they don't want their students, particularly uh, undergraduate students, living in studio apartments because they get isolated, they get socially isolated. And the biggest issue for most universities isn't debt, it is uh, mental health issues to do with loneliness. And parents who you ask them, what's your biggest fear about your son or daughter going to university? It's loneliness. Uh, it isn't failing the course, it's loneliness. Uh, and there are charities uh, it's like Student Minds that are really trying to focus now on this issue of student mental health. So, the um, the pandemic suggests let's all be in lots of little individual bubbles because that's the way you stay safe. But that's not the best thing from the point of view of, of mental health uh, and of also having a, a proper university experience where you're going to be intermingling with lots of other people. What you don't want is someone to spend most of their time locked away in their room. You want people to be engaging with others. COVID, of course, is 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 an issue. Uh, actually, with, this, with the cluster flat, at least you've got your self-contained bedroom and you've got your own ensuite toilet normally. So you don't have to go into the kitchen. You can probably, you know, you can just about cope from your room if you had to. But if you are going to deal with the cluster flat, at least it's six, seven or eight people who form a household. And then you, as a household, they can mix. And that's the policy that most universities and private operators are focusing on at the moment. Uh, you've got lots of households within these big halls of residence, lots of flats which have six, seven or eight bedrooms in. Um, I think in developing countries, um, the COVID is going to be a catalyst towards uh, an acceleration of the need to get away from very basic dorm style accommodation, which hasn't been seen really in the UK for 30, 40 years. Uh, but it's quite common in South Africa and East Africa. You quite often have, have dormitories with 10, 12, 15 people. Um, and we'll see a move towards three, four bedroom models. Uh, it has to be affordable though. In, in, in the emerging markets, affordability is everything. There is massive demand, but people have only got so much money. And so people will take a view on, on, on sharing a room with four people compared to the alternative, which is pretty grim. Uh, I might just be above a bar in a room shared with lots of other people with loud music at night and all sorts, no security for, for, for women and so on. So I think there's a whole piece there about how COVID is going to change the way that student housing is developed in emerging countries. In the UK, um, I don't think it's going to have that dramatic a difference on the, uh, the fundamental design. I think there'll be tweaks done to do with self-opening doors, uh, lift buttons or whether, so that operate with a wave or something rather than pressing a button um, and obviously you know people have got systems as they have in offices of one way around buildings and things at the moment and that's a way of dealing with this crisis and the hope is that obviously that in 18 months time or so uh, you know there'll be a, a bit of normality might be restored but things some things will have changed so I think that was answering your Covid question and Room types. Let's just talk international students for a minute. And yeah. um, so yeah. I mentioned earlier that, you know, roughly if we give or take, we've got about nearly 500,000 that are um, coming into the UK um, on a typical annual basis. Um, just to break that down, guys, that's about, um, you're looking at about uh, 143,000 are EU residents and the rest of that makeup is of um, non-EU. Um, how do you think the pandemic and Brexit will um, positively or negatively impact um, students coming into the UK? 
Okay, uh, let's deal with Brexit first. Um, the number of EU students uh, coming to study in the UK was about 8% of international student numbers was the uh, data that I had. Um, so EU students were yeah, not insignificant, but compared to all the other students coming from beyond the European Union, yeah. were a pretty small proportion. Yeah. Of that 8%, it looks as though uh, we've got a lower application this year from EU students. Well, that's not surprising because EU students used to have the right to come in and just pay British as the same as domestic students here, 9,000 a year, 9,250 a year. Uh, whereas if you are coming from outside the EU, you'd be charged an international student rate, which might be two or three times that or more. So no surprise, fewer EU students. Uh, and for universities, there has been a real crisis around Brexit. So I mean, they, they still haven't got their heads around that one yet, never mind COVID. Uh, they've lost research grant, or they're worried they're gonna lose research grants. They are worried that they're going to use lose staff who are worried who are worried about how welcome they will be in the UK. Uh, will they get work permits, long term visas, etc., and so on? Uh, and then, of course, the students. They were worried about losing their EU students. But on the other hand, the uh, just in with Brexit, not COVID, the numbers of international students have been increasing dramatically, and the universities have continued to be very successful. In attracting international students. Okay, then the COVID part of it, we've covered that to a degree in the sense that I've said that the international student numbers are taking a big hit and the universities are scared at the moment uh, because they don't know when the international students are going to come back. What sort of numbers do we anticipate that's going to look like at the end of this year? I don't, I can't tell you, I really don't know. Uh, the universities don't know either. Uh, it won't be a complete cutoff. There will be lots of international students who do travel. And many of them at the moment want to come and study, but physically can't. They can't get the visas, the travel, because uh, of quarantine issues. Uh, air, air flights have, have absolutely rocketed in price in many cases. So there are things that are stopping them coming at the moment. And I, I've tried very hard during this interview to give you facts that I can justify and substantiate. And I, it would be crazy for me to give you a percentage or whatever of how many might come. There are lots of international students who have come back and there are many halls of residence that are almost entirely full of international students still. Um, a lot have come from India and a lot have come from China. The reason that they're coming is uh, who are the, the two biggest rivals to the UK for international students is number one, the United States. That's the premier destination in student numbers terms for international students. And I don't really need to explain to you why some Chinese students might not want to go and study in the US. Uh, something to do with the president, I believe. Um, and the US has been doing itself no favors at all in the way that the impression it's giving as to how it wants to welcome international students. Um, for example, Muslim students, you imagine how a lot of them felt when uh, travel restrictions were put on Muslim countries at the start of the COVID crisis by the president. So the US has lost a lot of students. Now, the US doesn't really worry about it because they've got so many students anyhow. Uh, but a lot of students that were going to go to America might well come here. Our second biggest rival is Australia. And they are having a real ding-dong with China at the moment, uh, politically. A lot of students who are going to come and study in what was the most welcoming country to international students, particularly Chinese students, are not going to go to the US and they're not going to go to Australia. Yes. So whilst they won't all come to the UK, um, quite a number of them will. I uh, think that's to do with trade agreements issues. It's in. trade, but it's also <laughs> perceived racism yeah. that has uh, been the way it's been put in the Chinese press, for example. Yeah. Australia doesn't welcome Chinese people. There were stories that were well reported of uh, assaults on Chinese students in Sydney, for example, uh, that the Chinese press really picked up. And we've had those in the UK. We've had stories of Indian students, uh, students being beaten up and, and that being high in the headline news in India and there being a corresponding drop. We've had that over the years as well. Uh, but certainly those two key markets are suffering. Uh, so there are lots of other places in Europe that are offering English courses, sorry, foreign, uh, are offering courses in English. Uh, and these uh, 
courses taught in English has been one of the biggest growth sectors in higher education in Europe. And they're doing it to compete with the likes of the UK. And it is a threat because actually they're a lot cheaper um, and the accommodation is a fraction of the price. Generally accommodation in Europe is about a quarter of the price as it is in the UK. You know, typically they're paying per month what we're paying per week. Mm. Uh, so that's, you know, it, the fact that the UK continues to be where it is, is quite remarkable. And it, it is, I think, you know, it's, it's such a resilient sector. It's not invulnerable. This is a cliche I've been, I made up and I've been using a lot lately. It is not invulnerable, but it is remarkably resilient, particularly through economic crisis. And particularly now as we're dealing with, you know, worst pandemic since the 1918 flu. I predicted a few years ago that there would be two things that would be cause a problem in our sector. I said there would be a fire and that some students would be killed. Well, we didn't have a fire in a student block, we had it in Grenfell. And that did disrupt the sector, not so much because people were worried so much about student safety, but there was this issue about cladding. And much of the year before last was dominated by that issue. And then when I felt something like SARS would disrupt the international students coming. We wouldn't have our international students. Of course, what I didn't realize is that it would be so bad, it would disrupt everything. Uh, and that we'd have, never mind, you know, a lack of international students, we wouldn't have any domestic students at some point as well. So we have seen, you know, an extraordinary time. And whilst there will be massive coverage, as I said at the start in the press, about the issues uh, of universities, overcharging students or uh, of, of infections in student halls etc all the, pr the press are having a field day with it and they will continue to do so uh, all i can say is that the people actually running the halls of residence buying and owning the halls of residence they're taking a long-term view they know it's going to be a nightmare yeah they're just going to have to do the best they can but they do see this as something that will pass and they see the sector as one that is increasingly attractive to investors uh, despite all these issues. Love for you to talk about India if you could. Can you give some foresight on what your predictions are on India and what conversations you're having at the moment? I last visited India uh, about five years ago. So I haven't been for a while. But when I went five years ago uh, and I went to a tier two city or tier three arguably, um, Branchi, uh, there was a new university being built and they wanted some help as to how they could roll out student accommodation in Ranchi and then potentially also provide student accommodation elsewhere. And I went on a tour of what, was the, of, of what were the options were for students at that time. And it was awful. I mean, it was basically uh, the standard student accommodation would be uh, several bunk beds, nasty bunk beds, in, in a crowded room, one might have six or seven, ten bunk beds in, um, really poor quality, no service provision at all, uh, probably above a bar, um, not really safe as regards male, female, and for female students in particular, you really worry about it. Uh, so, the, you know, it was squalor, basically, a lot, of, a lot of the basic accommodation. And then I can tell you that having worked in East Africa prior to being involved in, in property, um, it's very similar to what I saw in a lot of East Africa in Kenya, uh, where uh, basic student accommodation was a few rooms above a hotel, uh, a little tiny little shop bar arrangement. And no safety, no security. People were just glad to have a roof over their head, but it really wasn't satisfactory. <coughs> Excuse me. What's happening now in India, which is really quite exciting, is that uh, with you know, one of the biggest higher education sectors in terms of numbers globally, um, we are seeing the development of purpose-built student accommodation. It's not normally of the same um, standard uh, in terms of facilities as we're seeing in the UK, but there is some of it which is targeted at that level. But we are certainly seeing um, people be given the basic safe amenities. Uh, and you know, that's you know, a good roof over your head, a degree of privacy. Yes, probably sharing your room still, but not with 12 people, probably with three or four. Um, good Wi-Fi, which is right above there, right up there with a roof over your head for most students' priorities. Uh, and you know, decent sanitation and, 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 and you know, a reliable electricity supply and so on. So we are actually seeing that model being rolled out. And we're also seeing an asset light model quite common in India. In the UK, most developers, operators own their assets, 
uh, the freeholds of the buildings. In India, it's becoming increasingly common for an operator to take a lease on a building. So they don't have to fork out the capital on buying the building. Uh, they just operate it and pay a rent to the landlord as a, as a sort of ground rent type arrangement. Uh, and that's enabling the sector perhaps to grow a bit faster. Also in India, it's growing faster than it did in the UK because it's recognised as an asset class. You don't have to reinvent the wheel telling people what student housing is in the way that I had to for the first 15 years of my career. And that's been the same in Europe as well, mainland Europe. Uh, the market now in Spain, Germany uh, is, is pretty mature. And it develops really quickly over the last 10 years or so. Uh, it's still developing in Italy. I'd say it's you know, still relatively nascent in Italy. Um, it's nascent in the Nordics. Uh, it's nascent in Eastern Europe. But it's happening much, so much faster than, than what I experienced. And that's the exciting thing now about the emerging markets is because people understand that this is a global asset class, a lot of lenders now can, can look at the UK or they can look at Australia or they can look at India uh, and see that, look, actually, you know, this is a pretty reliable sector. Uh, and you know, notwithstanding disruption of COVID, um, you know, it has had remarkably strong occupation because universities, you know, they're not short-term businesses. They, you know, in the UK, they've been around hundreds of years in many cases, longer else in, in some, some situations. So it is seen as a, as a, as a you know, resilient long-term sector. And in Africa, um, South Africa, there's quite a lot of purpose-built portfolios of five, 10, 15,000 beds. So we're seeing the sector really taking off there. The challenge is affordability. Uh, I've just been doing some work this last week with the World Bank, who uh, are looking at ways as to how they can support student housing um, being developed in scale uh, across uh, emerging markets such as, such as Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. So there really is, there's a lot of interest in seeing student housing as a, as a way of empowering democracy as well as empowering uh, learning. Um, there are barriers, you know, universities tend to be the first places that political riots happen and so governments shut them down and uh, you have uh, rent strikes and riots and all sorts. So there are, there are issues, it's not straightforward. But it is seen actually as a sector which can change people's lives. There is such a thirst for higher education. Uh, and, and it's one of the reasons, I'm, you know, although I I have a slight unease about the fact that a lot of the UK student accommodation is aimed at students who've got a lot of money, and it would be great to see more being done at an affordable level. Uh, I think there's more good than harm being done with the provision of student housing uh, being handled the way it has over the last decade or so. But of course, if you talk to the NUS, uh, they they take the view that you know it's private sector, it's capitalism, it's you know it's it's not fair on students, uh, it's not fair on uh, students who've already got student debts that be paying high rents, etc. So uh, there are, you have to be aware that there are some very different perspectives on the benefits of, of, of the sector. But I can honestly say from my point of view, I think some great communities are being created in student housing. I think they're caring communities. I think the operators have moved on from giving you the key at the beginning of the year and taking it off you at the end of the year. They now are much more involved in what we call a student life programme. Um, there's an element of pastoral care from the operators mimicking to a degree the pastoral care that universities have always taken or meant to take for their students. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things that are really positive to tell about the evolution of this sector. We're starting to see a shift in what uh, place universities have in the modern workplace and digital learning. Do you anticipate learning behaviour would change? Students will start going to universities two days on campus as opposed to five. And um, will that have a significant impact on these investment portfolios? I mentioned already the my views on the massive open online courses. Yeah, I don't believe they are a major threat to the existing model of attending university in person. And I think that one thing that the pandemic has made clear is that people like being together when they can. And if you look at sort of you know when the days after lockdown was lifted, it was a great sort of let's go to the beach, let's a party, whatever. Uh, people want to mingle. Um, and the actual experience of going to university and, 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 and meeting people different to yourself, you know, that's not something you can study in a book. It's not something that even an online chat with Zoom and no matter how 
much easier and more accepted Zoom is now, it is not going to be, I believe, a serious threat uh, to universities. But what I do think is that the higher education experience will have to change, it will have to adapt. And you're right, maybe that will there will be an element of um, part-time studying, perhaps to a certain degree, maybe more vocational. I think universities are probably not producing some of the vocational elements that uh, that some employees would like to see. Uh, I think, uh, that, you know, there is talk of, of the likes of Google uh, and Microsoft creating universities uh, and that those would be significantly online uh, or that they would have perhaps a, a year's teaching uh, and then a year's placement in a, in a tech company. Uh, and I can see that being a very good way. And I think if I wanted, for example, to get on in computer software, I'm not sure three years at university would be the right thing to do. I think probably it is going to be a case of doing some groundwork at university and then going on and having on you know some some uh, in job experience in employment experience. So I've no doubt that there will be changes. And we've also talked historically about changing from a uh, a three uh, a three year model to a two year model and shortening the holidays. Uh, so people would spend less time at university and be more intensive. Uh, again, I'm not quite sure whether that's a, well, whether that be a good or bad thing for, for for the operators. I suppose it'd be people would require beds for less time. Um, but as I said, there's a lot more people potentially in that 18 year old bracket wanting to go to university in the future as numbers increase. So we need to create some extra space at universities. And how are we going to do that? Uh, no, of course, it, the university education will change. It must change. Uh, and the universities at the moment went to the university saying, give us a big bailout because we're in crisis. And the government said, no, we'll give you a bit, but you've got to change. So we will see change come whether the universities like it or not in terms of the funding that's available to them. And many of them will become less reliant on universities, on, on government funding, because they want to be able to do things their way. And for them, well, that's fine. They can do that if they're some of the top. Russell Group, as we call it, universities, the top elite universities, they can go and issue a bank bond or something like that and raise substantial sums, no problem at all. But if you're a middle or lower ranking university, perhaps in the form of polytechnic, uh, your options are not so, uh, not, not so clear. So uh, we will see mergers, I think, of universities. Uh, we might see closures, but they will be managed closures. Uh, the government will not let a university just shut overnight. Uh, we have seen historically mergers and we will see mergers in, in, in the near future, I suspect. The very last question for you yeah. is around um, gaps and opportunities, around empty buildings, um, and will we see, start seeing an alternative use in, to buildings? And if so, what do you anticipate that could look like? If you're a, a student housing developer, who might also be an operator probably as well at the moment, uh, you're looking at this current crisis as uh, just as much an opportunity as a threat. Uh, and there are a lot of people looking at uh, former hospitality buildings, maybe hotel complexes, uh, people looking at high streets that are largely empty of retail, and the government now is making it very easy to convert those to residential. So uh, as long as they can be adapted in a way that's providing quality accommodation, I think we will see quite a lot of um, residential built in high streets and a fair bit of that might well be micro living and a fair bit of that micro living might be student housing. So um, that's a change. I also think investors are increasingly looking not just at student housing in isolation, but they're looking at the other micro living sectors of co-living and some of the uh, PR of the private rental sector built to rent relatively small accommodation units because there is a big demand for independent living. So, uh, you know, the number of households has increased very dramatically, uh, be it through divorce or age or whatever. Uh, and, and so we are seeing a, a great increase in demand for relatively small uh, accommodation. And a number of local authorities are very worried about that because they're saying, no, they're the slums of the future. You've got to have minimum size standards. But student housing and co-living, and to some extent built to rent, are challenging that and are saying um, size doesn't matter, it's the quality that matters, uh, and that you should be able to uh, provide quality accommodation that is efficiently planned, 
uh, really efficient use of space. Um, a lot of communal parks would be quite a common theme. Again, a bit of an issue with the COVID thing, but looking beyond COVID, um, the trend is towards more communal areas, and less private space. And I think there will be uh, an increase in development of uh, an increase in merger between student housing, co-living, and some of this uh, young professional housing and, and uh, people who perhaps aren't going to go on and buy a house, uh, if not soon, any time in the near future, uh, who perhaps want to rent something in the city centre. So there's an interesting, uh, what the US might call a multifamily type investment asset class uh, that we at JLL call living, um, the living asset class. We think you know that's a big growth area. Uh, and uh, looks to be uh, an area that investors, I think, will be focusing on in the near future. So, yeah, look, the, the, there's nothing good about COVID whatsoever, but there will be people who uh, see some opportunities out of some of the changing natures of the high street, uh, there's the, the demise of some areas of hospitality, which I think is facing an existential threat. Uh, and that's why I, I do get frustrated when I hear people talking about student housing in the same category as as some of the issues facing the hospitality sector because student housing is going to be here you know, for a long time to come as long as there are universities and you know the things that the people always need health uh, they always need education um, and then you also get old as well so senior living that's another, another talk for another day but there's always going to be a need for provision of that and that's another huge you know, sector which of course is uh, grossly underprovided for in this country and i always say they always need a roof over their head and they always need food as well so if you're in those four sectors you're pretty much okay long term wise yeah i mean the two <laughs> sectors that have thrived in this last five years have been beds and sheds logistics and residential and residential including students amongst other things we've uh, got to continue this conversation for sure i'm conscious of time so philip thank you so much it's been great to have you here um, I would like to bring you back at some point. If people want to get in contact with you, what's the best way? You can give out my email address. Is that the best way now? Or do you, would you provide that at the end? Yeah, we can provide that or I can include your details. Guys, I'll include um, Philip's details. Um, LinkedIn. Yeah, mobile, right? mobile number and email, I think, is probably the best way. Brilliant. Okay. Well, what I'll do is I'll include your LinkedIn um, profile. People can connect with you and um, have a com continue this conversation. It's been fascinating talking to you. And That's good. I hope my builders weren't too noisy in the background. You might have your, your <laughs> I'm drill. sure people will forgive you for that. That's absolutely <laughs> fine. Guys, we'll All see right. you on the next recording. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed that. And don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.